Hello, everybody, and welcome to the third episode of the Jaguar Maven podcast uh, brought to you by John Shipley and Treep Talks. Treep, uh, go ahead and say what's up to the people. What's going on, everybody? It's Treep from Treep Talks here. I hope you guys are having a great Tuesday. Well, I guess it'll be going out on Wednesday, a great Wednesday uh, morning, afternoon, whenever you're listening to this. And hopefully by now you're over that, uh, that Jaguar defeat. Oh yeah, no, yeah. We're 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 going to be talking a good bit about the uh, latest Jaguars. Uh, I, I I think calling it a debacle is honestly pretty accurate. Yeah. Like I try not to be too harsh on them sometimes, but man, that that game. I, we'll, we'll we'll get more into it. But uh, th- thank you guys again uh, for listening. Like I said, this is the third episode we've uh, put two out in the last two weeks. Really trying to get this off the ground while we do the same with uh, Jaguar Maven. Uh, remember to follow us on Twitter. It's uh, at Jaguar Maven. And then you can register as a follower on the site for free. You just have to go to si.com slash Jaguars, hit the follow button in the top right, and then it registers you as a follower. There's no cost or anything. It will send you, uh, e- email you highlights, all that kind of stuff. We put out several pieces of content a day. And it's not like clickbait content either. Like we, we really honestly do deep dives and try to give you some substance. And uh, we're boots on the ground at the stadium every day. And I I think that kind of gives us something that you can't find a lot of other uh, places online. So, uh, you know, now that we're back into the swing of things with the podcast, uh, we're going to be talking, first of all, about uh, the number one thing on everybody's minds. Uh, The Jaguars are now four and six. I mean, you and I talked on the last podcast about how they had basically maybe 1% room for margin of error. That kind of – they already kind of <laughs> used all that up. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, they, they lost 33-13 to 13 to the Colts. D- d- just give me your general reaction to that game. I think the first drive, man, I tweeted out, where all, where, where are all the Nick Foles haters out there? He looked so impressive in the first drive. Yeah. And then he went nine straight scoreless drives yeah. on offense. I mean, he started like six and seven, didn't he? Through those first two drives, I I think he looked comfortable in the offense. I think uh, John DeFlippo did a nice job giving him those kind of easier throws, and I think he showed uh, good chemistry with the receivers, mainly DJ Chark. And like we said, he started off six and seven, but uh, you know, then until garbage time, uh, the entire offense didn't really do a thing. I mean, w- were you surprised by? Uh, kind of uh, not just his performance, but the offensive performance in general? I was super shocked by the offensive performance because, you know, it it just looked like Nick Foles wasn't really Nick Foles like after the first couple of drives. I mean, you hit the nail right on the head. The first two drives, he looked comfortable. He was taking the easy throws, you know, basically doing what a Jaguar quarterback needs to do in this offense. And then you come into the third, fourth drive, and then when we're down three, You know, Nick Foles is trying to risk it for the biscuit. You know, he's trying to throw it into double coverage. Yeah, Yeah, DJ Chark has been, you know, emerging as like a number one wide receiver for us, but he's still really not on that level to catch a ball in double coverage. And, I mean, not a lot of NFL receivers are even on that level. And, you know, he was off. He was throwing picks. It was just – it was hard to watch, you know, knowing that there was so much hype built around it and there's so much – knowing what how Nick Foles is and how he usually does in times like this. And it, it was hard to watch at times. And uh, honestly, I think that's my biggest reason why I think that loss was so deflating to so many people. Uh, the fact that the return of Foles got hyped up for so long, you know, not just since he got named starter, even before that, because I, I, I had written at Jaguar Maven several times that, People should have expected Foles uh, to be back as a starter. That should have always been the foregone conclusion. So I feel like for weeks they've kind of, you know, been hyping up this return. And then when you come out and, you know, kind of lay an egg like that, it can't help feel like anything but deflating. You know what I mean? And I, I, I've seen a lot of people uh, look at his box score, you know, and talk about the game. I don't think that's really fair when, when you know, uh-huh. analyzing how he played because – uh, I feel like a solid like third to half of his good production came when it was already like 31 to seven, you know, and that, that one, you know, he threw two touchdowns and one interception. Well, the second touchdown came with a minute left in the 31 to seven game. And truthfully, the Colts dropped three other interceptions, you know? Yeah. And it was just, it didn't look like Nick Foles. And I mean, it, it just, it didn't look like, 
Foles was ready to come back. Yeah, and I, like, I was going to say, did, did it seem like to you that his arm did not look like it had that normal Foles zip? Because that's what kind of said to me, like, okay, is he, is he ready, ready? You know, like, Foles didn't look ready in the slightest bit to me. And yeah. the thing that, you know, makes it frustrating from a team standpoint is that, you know, you had to have watched him practice throughout the week. You had to have known, like, hey, you know, Foles isn't really looking like he's 100% back. You should have never put Nick Foles in that situation to begin with. If you had any doubts about his health, and, you know, Minshew right now is 500 since being a starter. You have, you know, I would say, you know, looking back at what we know now from that Colts game, I'd say Minshew probably gives you like the same exact amount of chance of winning that football game. Yeah. And he's a hundred percent healthy. So, I mean, you look yeah. at how Foles performed and he didn't look like himself and, you know, it, it, they had to have some sort of idea that he wasn't playing to his full potential or he wasn't fully healthy. I, I, I think so. My only thing is all the reports coming out from practice all week, whenever, you know, uh, you, obviously, when I ask a player in the locker room, hey, how's the starting quarterback looking? He, he's not going to tell me, no, nah, he doesn't look good. But it seemed like guys genuinely and enthusiastically thought that he was killing it in practice. And DJ Truck even said after the game, you know, when you have a great week of practice and we come out and we play the way we did, it's kind of discouraging. From all reports, the Jaguars had a great week of practice. You know, the, the, the offense and even, you know, in the parts that the media was allowed to view, I mean – you know, it it was looking fine. It really was. So I'm I, I'm not sure what happened. Maybe it was the fact that you know no live reps in two months. But it 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 was certainly a think I think a, a tough game uh, to really consume just because it was really a stagnant offense for the majority of four quarters. And any time the Jaguars throw the ball 47 times and only mm. run it nine times. That's not a recipe for success. You know, they are not built to be that kind of team that just airs it out, airs it out. No, and I think that's kind of what Flip was thinking headed into this game was like, I got my quarterback back. I got Nick Foles back. You know, I can air it out. I can, you know, extend the playbook because his offense, you know, supposedly was tailored for Nick Foles, like the way they were going to run their offense. And if that was a showing on how the Jaguars were going to run their offense in 2019, it's almost a good thing Minshew came in there yeah. when he did because, you know, Leonard's getting the reps. And Leonard's showing you that he is a big part of this offense. And, you know, you've seen like Raquel Armstead getting like – extended reps I mean he didn't get necessarily like a whole lot of reps but you've seen that they took Leonard Fournette off the field a lot more than they have in past weeks and it's like they tried turning away from Fournette when that has been the identity of the offense since you know he's been drafted yeah no it it was the uh, least amount of snaps and percentage of snaps that the Fournette had played uh, all season and they had started even rotating early but I mean I, I think that's a great point um you know, uh, head coach Doug Marone has talked a ton about the team's 47 to 9 pass run ratio, uh, both following the game on Sunday and during his uh, media availability yesterday. And I, I, I'm going to lay out for you. I wrote it in an article on Jaguar Maven already that you can check out. It goes a little more in depth. But I'm going to lay out for you his logic and you just give me your thoughts on it, okay? Okay. Okay. He said that when the Colts drove down the field on the first drive of the second half and they were able to both run the ball and use a ton of clock. He thought that the offense needed to score and they needed to score quickly. And that's why he got away from the run because of how well the Colts were running the ball. He wanted to air it out more. He admitted afterwards that it was a mistake, but it was his mistake. And he did that specifically when somebody asked about Flip's play calling. So it it really, I got the sense that he was the one that was like, okay, we need to air this out. Do, do you – I mean, obviously it wasn't the right call because we see how the game went. Do you think it it was a logical call, though, that, hey, the other team scoring points and putting together drives, we need to completely forget about Leonard Fournette? Because, mind you, it was only 17-7 to 7 after that first Colts drive of the second half. Well, I can see kind of both sides of the coin in that aspect. Mm-hmm. Uh, first of all, I mean, when the Jags are ever down two possessions or more – it always feels like they are going to just blow it. Like, I don't know about you, but when they were down 17-7, it almost felt like they were up 42 to nothing. Like, I understand that aspect of it. You got an offense that isn't known for 
big comeback. So, you know, you want to try and score as quickly as you can. I get that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Leonard Fournette's a guy on your offense that you can go to for big plays, for explosive plays, to get you down the field. And that logic doesn't really make much sense either because I don't know if you noticed this, but something I really noticed in the second half was is that every time Nick Foles came up to snap the ball, the play clock was at four seconds, three seconds, two seconds. Like he was taking forever to snap the ball. Like it was, it it was almost like they were in the lead. They were taking so long. So even if that was his theory, it was poorly executed. They did, they didn't leave a lot of time on the play clock for themselves. I think that, you know, like I said, Leonard's like a big part of your offense. And whether mm-hmm. you get him involved in the passing game, like he has shown all season long that he can, you know, contribute to, or if you want to keep it on the ground with him and uh, try and get, you know, five, six yards, you're still in the third quarter. You're still only down 10. But like I said, with the Jags, it always feels like a two possession game is more than what it is. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I, I completely understand that. Like when, when Marone said that, I, I thought, you know, I get it because you have this $88 million quarterback that you think can be your franchise quarterback. Uh, realistically, that should be a guy that's able to get you back into a 17-7 ball game. But like you said, Leonard Fournette is a big play machine. He is tied for fourth in the NFL and rushes of 20 yards or longer this year because he has six. I mean, you, you've seen games like, uh, you know, the Broncos game where he can change the entire tide of the offense with a big run. He did it against uh, the Panthers. He did it against the Jets on the second play of the game. He can still give you big plays when you're running the ball, but you have to get him into a rhythm. That's one thing I've always said about Leonard Fournette and that people need to remember is he is very much a volume back. You cannot give him, you know, 15 touches a game between the pass and run game and expect him to make a big impact. He needs the ball a good bit, you know. That's just the fact of it is that that's the player they drafted at number four overall. He has even said it in the past. He feels like he needs 20 to 25 carries a game to really, you know, get get into his rhythm and get going. And I think when you only give him eight carries a game, you might as well be, you know, taking eight kneel downs because he's not going to be able to get into any rhythm. He is not going to be able to break off any big runs. And it's just I, – I, I feel like from the jump, they kind of, you know, like you had said, they panicked when they went down two scores. And the reason why I think they panicked is actually going to be the next thing we talk about because obviously when you lose a game 33 or 13, it is not all one side of the ball's fault. The Jaguars offense was not good on Sunday, but uh, it could be argued that the defense was even worse than the bad offense was. I mean, do do you think the defense was worse than the offense? I said this in my video uh, that I dropped on Monday, and I was talking to one of my close friends about it. They always say in the NFL, you can never have too many pass rushers. I beg to differ on that because the Jags are so built off of pass rushers that during run plays, they seem like they're just finding themselves so far up the field that like these often and the offensive line dominated this Jags defensive line. Don't get me wrong. But on a lot of occasions, like you see guys like Yannick and Gawkway, Clays Campbell, Taven Bryan, like they're all so far up field that they're completely taking themselves out of the play. Like it's just, it's poor discipline. It's poor lane integrity. And, you know, the linebackers, too, they just – they didn't contribute either. Either they were bodied up, they couldn't make a tackle to save their lives. This was probably Miles Jack's worst outing. So, when you say that this defense was just as bad as his offense, I have to agree with you. And, you know, there's some people out there that are still all aboard the Saxonville train and all aboard this Jaguar defense that, you know, refuse to acknowledge the fact that this defense played bad. But this defense played bad, and it might yeah. have been their worst performance I've ever seen them. Play. Yeah, no, I, I, I think the standard of the 2017 Jacksonville defense, I think that needs to be completely, you know, thrown out the window, long forgotten, because one, every season is a new season, and two, the personnel is drastically different. You know, the coaching staff's yep. the same. Some of the players, like Calais and Unique, are still there, but overall, it's way different. And I've said before, I think it was after the Panthers game, the thing that Jaguars defense lacks is – size and strength up the spine of the defense by that I mean they do not have a lot of true run stopping anchor defensive tackles and they don't really have that thumper in the middle you know I mean Avery Jones has been a while for a good minute and he's been a serviceable player but just in my personal opinion I do not think he has been uh, very good as a starting nose tackle this year Um, I'm a big Taven Bryan fan especially against the run because of how well he does get upfield but you need more than just him you know what I mean and I, I, I think Calais, uh, for as disruptive as he is, he's not a very rangy player, so you can kind of get away from him. And like you said, he gets upfield a good bit. 
And then Yannick, as good as he's been against the run, you can kind of put like multiple guys on him, like the Colts did, some true power blockers. Because he beats guys with his speed in the run game pretty easy. But if you can like get your hands on him, you can block him out of the play. And and then, you know, you get to the linebackers and Najee Good, Miles Jack, and Leon Jacobs, they were a far cry from Telvin, Miles, and Paul Pazlesny, you know, two years ago. It is just the fact of the matter. The linebacking unit has it regressed in 2018. And in my view, it has regressed again this year. I, I, I can't put my finger on why, but when you look at it, multiple different players have struggled playing linebacker for the Jaguars this year. And when so many players have the same issues, I kind of think that has to come down to how they're being coached. 100%. And it's – the coaching is an issue because, I mean, you look at, like, the scheme that they're running. Todd yeah. Wash has been the problem for a while. And, you know, I'm not trying to put all the blame on Wash because there are some players to be blamed for this. Like I said, yeah. you know, you go back, you watch the game. And it, it just seems like – every defensive lineman that is involved in a run play just completely takes themselves out of the run play. And it's just, it's free range. Like it's just too easy. Yeah. Like 200, you should not be giving up 119 yards to Jonathan Williams. I don't even know who that is. It's the third time this year they've allowed 200 yards rushing. That is astonishing. And I, I think they missed Marcel Darius a good bit. I don't think even he fixes a lot of that, though. I think the problems go deeper. Like I said, I just do not think they have the personnel to stop the run. Uh, I don't think the scheme really does them any favors. And then the players, they just need to play better. You know, I mean, we we can talk all we want about Todd Wash, Todd Wash, Todd Wash, but uh, the players need to perform. I mean, it just comes down to it. When you're one of the highest paid middle linebackers in the NFL, you cannot be guessing wrong on so many plays running out of your gap on so many plays and blocking yourself on so many plays like the Jaguars linebackers have been doing this season. So I I, I think that's been the defense's biggest issue this year. And, uh, you know, I think that a good solution, I laid out a couple on Jaguar Maven the other day. I think Derek Brown from Auburn, he's a complete war daddy at defensive tackle. (laughs) Dude's like 320 something pounds and he, he moves like a dancing bear. I think if you're a Jaguar fan who's ready for draft talk, you need to like circle Derek Brown's name and like put it at the top of your wish list and just, you know, hope and pray with everything that you have <laughs> that Derek Brown's going to be there with one of their first round picks. Cause I really do think he's a guy that he's kind of exactly, you know, what they need. But I mean, I think it's a good point. And, and another thing, Tree, who, who would you say the best run defending defensive lineman or best run defending front seven player is right now? I, I want to see if you have the same thought that I do. Probably Yannick and Gawkwe. Like, yeah. I mean, if, if I if I had probably him, and then I mean, you know, Marcel Darius in the past, but he's obviously hurt, so I'd probably say Yannick and Gawkwe. Like, what, like off the top of the head. What about Josh Allen? Josh Allen's just a freak. And see, I I think Josh Allen's more. He doesn't play at. Okay. Yeah, and see that that and that's the point I was trying to make. You don't see him with a lot of run defending reps, right? Yeah. But we've seen him set the edge. Terrific when he has he played the run. Dude is 6'4", 265. He is built to play the run. He only played 51% of the snaps on Sunday. If you want to stop the run more, I think you have to play Josh Allen more. Well, you look at, like, Josh Allen in general. Like, every time he's in there, I watch him, and he makes a play. It's crazy. Yeah. Like, like, if you just keep it – and it might be due to the fact he doesn't play that many snaps and he's so fresh, but – you know, whether it be a pass rushing down and you're right, like he does well against the run game. And I think Yan does too. I think it just comes down really to the guys in the middle. And like you said, with Miles Jack, I think we paid Miles Jack top middle linebacker money for a guy that's like a true Will linebacker or a true Sam linebacker. Like he's not a true middle linebacker. He lacks the size. We need a bigger guy like that in the middle. And we do need help on the inside. But I think as far as like the edge setters go and like when there's an outside run, You'll see Yannick and Gawkway like extend that beautifully. You'll see Josh Allen do that as well. Yeah. I think most of the running issues start with the guys that are in the middle. Yeah, yeah. No, I and I I, I would agree with that. Like I said, I, I just think they need better, you know, both production and personnel inside. So I, I think we're both in you know in agreement with that. But um, I I mean, we kind of other than that, I mean, the Colts game basically went 
okay, Jaguars throw the ball a ton, don't do anything. Jaguars get ran all over. Jacob Brissett doesn't do that much. It's not like there were a ton of storylines, you know, from this game. It was, no. it was pretty cut and dry. It was just – it was terrible to, like, to watch because, you know, I'm watching it objectively more than I have, and I'm trying to, like, take notes, and I'm just like – it's simple. Like, exa- like, they always say, oh, the stats don't tell the whole story. Nick Foles' stats don't tell the whole story, but if you look at the – if you look at the Colts rushing numbers, that tells the whole entire story. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And, you know, I, I think that's just a game that there's not a lot to take from. I mean, the things that you can take from it are, like we had said, the Jaguars struggle to defend the run. We already knew that coming in, and I think they have to change a lot of things uh, for the Nick Foles offense to be successful. But, you know, uh, moving into this next game, they, they play the Tennessee Titans in Nashville on Sunday. It's actually a 4 p.m. Uh, kickoff, so you'll be treated to a 1 p.m. Oh, kickoff. Yes. Oh, yeah. Dude, I'm, yes. I'm sick. Three of their next four games are at 4 p.m. I'm, I'm sick. I'm, I'm, I'm an East Coast bias uh, guy time. I love my 1 p.m. kickoffs, so I you know, get my work out of the way. And I, I, <laughs> I, I, I am just disgusted with how many 4 p.m. kickoff games they have over the next month. So your boy gets to sleep in, though. Because, you know, that, that 10 a.m. kickoff is you know, some sometimes it's just a little bit too much for me because, you know, your boy likes to have fun on uh, on Friday yeah, night, on yeah. Saturday night. So, you know, <laughs> getting up at 1 p.m. to watch the Jags play, you know, it, it, it's a weird feeling. And, I mean, I could probably like 10 times, I feel like, over the last, like, four years that they've had those type of kickoffs that aren't, like, West Coast games. So, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm excited for the kickoff. But, you know, my boy John's going to be working late. <laughs> so. Yeah. I mean, and, you know uh, – when it comes to Jaguars Titans, that's always a game people anticipate just because of the rivalry between the two teams. Uh, the Titans are five and five right now. They're a whole game ahead of the Jaguars. Uh, the Jaguars routed them in week three of the season. Obviously, things have changed since then. Uh, Gardner Minshew is no longer starting at quarterback. Jalen Ramsey is no longer on the Jaguars. Uh, Marcus Mariota is no longer starting for the Titans. These are two pretty different teams than they were in week three. Um, I mean. Can, can you just talk about what you see in that matchup and who do you think has the edge, at least right now? I think the Tennessee Titans have the better mediocre white quarterback. <laughs> I like I like Ryan Tannehill. I've always liked Ryan Tannehill. And I think the fact that he's putting these games together and that they beat the Kansas City freaking Chiefs, like, out of any team in the league, are you kidding me? Yeah. Like, you know, Ryan Tannehill's always kind of been that guy. Like yeah. he's been that guy that you know he'll he'll shock you every now and again, but he'll always be average. Like he'll never be bad. You know what I mean? But yeah, I I think that you know the biggest worry about this game is Derrick Henry, Derrick yeah. Henry. Yeah, I, 100%. And, I, and I think that it's gonna be the thing that you should focus on because. All these wide receivers that the Titans have, I'm not 100% worried about them. I think A.J. Boye, Herndon's done a good job, and hopefully D.J. Hayden's finger gets better because holy <laughs> moly, yeah. his finger looks messed up. If you need to see that, uh, go check out uh, D- Demetrius's, uh, you know, D- at Demetrius82. Check out his Twitter account from uh, yesterday. He posted a picture of D.J. Hayden, posted on Instagram with his finger, and it's – it, 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 you've seen Brian Baldinger's uh, finger, you know, Baldy on uh, Twitter, the NFL Network dude. Have you ever seen his finger? Yeah, yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's what it reminded me of. Not like maybe yeah. half as bad, but yeah. still, that's what it reminded me of. I was like, oh, oh, goodness, DJ, what, what happened? <laughs> like so I, I think the secondary will do fine. I think they'll be able to uh, shut what they have down. And I think – the Jaguars are not going to learn their lesson. I think they're going to throw the ball a good amount again this time. And uh, hopefully this time around, it's a little bit more successful. And, you know, we always, you know, Jaguar fans always talk about like, they're like, I don't care if we go two and 14 as long as we beat the Titans twice. Like, I don't care if we do this as long as we beat the Titans twice. So if they beat the Titans twice, and I've seen that on your Twitter timeline that you don't care as long as you beat the Titans twice, your uh, complaining card gets taken away. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i hear you man and <laughs> it, i i can't explain why the titans have seemed to have the jaguars number under doug marone but it is just so funny to me that the jaguars quarterback to finally vanquish the all my tennessee titans was Gardner Minshew, a six round pick who wasn't even supposed to start you know i mean even blake bortles in his best season in 2017 and in the season where he was paid a buttload of money in 2018 he couldn't beat the Titans. You know, I, it, it, I, I can't explain why 
those games are always tough, but it, they are. It, it seems like two teams that genuinely, I think, uh, you know, want to get after each other. So they're really like true physical throwback AFC South games. And that's kind of why I enjoy, honestly, when the Jaguars and Titans play, because it's normally at the very least a physical game. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, but I, I'm with you. I think Derrick Henry uh, has to be, you know, public enemy number one for Jacksonville, uh, you know, this Sunday. They, they bottled him up pretty well in week three, held him under 50 rushing yards, though uh, I believe it was two of his three longest runs were negated due to penalties. So he should have had more, but his offensive line or wide receivers let him down. But I, I think he is definitely the worrisome part about this week because no more so Darius. Uh, mm-hmm. who, who do you have in the lineup really that can stop Derrick Henry? I mean, I, 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 how do you think they can go about stopping Derrick Henry? Do they just load the box and make Ryan Tannehill try to beat him? I, I think you go total 2018 Jaguars on them, where the whole strategic way to beat the Jags was make Blake Bortles throw the ball. I think they need to make Ryan Tannehill throw the ball, and I think they should be loading the box. They should put as many bodies in there as they can and make sure that Derrick Henry doesn't gash us, gash the Jaguars for over 200 yards, and we can't, you know, they, they can't make that mistake. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, and just talking about Derrick Henry, he's a dude that kind of like Fournette, he can break off a long run at any time. I, he, he's feasted against the Jaguars in the past. Sands, oh, yeah. Sands, week three. W- week three, they, they did a great job against them. Quincy Williams, I thought, played a really solid game in week three, but he, he is no longer uh, having a starting role on the defense. I mean, that, that's another thing that's changed. Now it's Najee Good trying to track him down instead of Quincy Williams. So, I mean, that, that's definitely going to be the big factor. But I think another big factor is going to be how the Jaguars play on the offensive line because – Man, that Titans defensive line, it, it might not have a ton of household names, but, man, it is it is fierce. I mean, between Harold Landry, Jarrell yeah. Casey, and Jeffrey Simmons, that, that that's one of the best trios you're going to find anywhere. Yeah, and that, that's facts. You know, the offensive line is going to have to contribute well. And I think they did a good job, you know, in week two uh, or week three, whatever it was. Yeah, they did. The, they did. The Titans last time they went and played them. And uh, I think a lot of that had to do with Minshew's pocket mobility. So I think um, Foles is going to have to be a little bit more aware in the pocket. You know, the announcers uh, talked about it in the game and said, you know, Foles brings this. Like, he's not just a pocket passer. Like, he can move out of the pocket and make these throws. But he did it, like, once. And you never seen it again. And I just mm-hmm. – I, th- I think, like, as long as they keep a clean pocket – then I think it should be a good game. And you really need to give Leonard Fournette the ball as much as you can. Yeah. And, and I think another thing, too, I could be wrong about this, but I don't think Taylor Lewan played last time the Jags played. No, him, he so didn't. Think, yeah, you're right. He didn't play. That, that, so I think that, that might that's be, a good point. That might be another advantage for Tennessee over there, too. Yeah, no, that, that's a good point. I didn't even consider, you know, the fact that Taylor Lewan uh, didn't play last time. As, as you know, he was serving his uh, four-game PED suspension. Uh, since oh, yeah. then, he's come back, and he's had penalty issues, but he still played, you know, pretty solid. He's still a good run defender, so I, I agree with that. And just in terms of the offensive line, I, I saw a lot of people complaining about them this past Sunday against the Colts. When I went back and we watched the game, they did not pass block at – that badly at all honestly no I agree I agree the times the Colts got home was when they were sending like six to seven guys you know on blitzes no I 100% agree and I and I heard that same thing and I I did the same you know looking back at it I thought most of the sacks were either from them sending more guys than they can block yep. or from Nick Foles just holding on to the ball too long and, and, and Foles did that a lot and I you know, tip of the hat to the Colts because I think blitzing Nick Foles is how you beat him because he, you know, when you blitz Gardner Minshew, he can make you pay for it. You know, I mean, yeah. he can he can evade guys in the pocket. You're not really going to see Foles do that. So I think sending guys at him and forcing him off his spot is how you defend them. And, you know, credit to the Colts because they did that. But I, I think as a whole, I did not think the offensive line uh, pass blocked poorly against the Colts. But the Titans are much better up front than the Colts are. So it's just going to be a completely different challenge. But I'm really interested, honestly, to see how they approach this game offensively because I feel like it can go one of two ways. I feel like they can completely 
overcorrect and feed Leonard Fournette in a game where he I, – like, I could see them giving him the ball 30 times in a game where he averages, like, three-something yards per carry, you know, where they just keep doing it even though it's not working. Or yeah. – I could see them kind of ignore him again. if Because, I mean, if, if things go sideways, it just kind of seems like with Doug Marone's comments about why he got away from the run, it seems like when his team goes down by more than one possession, he does not have the confidence that they can really, you know, hold it together unless they air it out. So if, if the Jaguars go down by more than one possession on Sunday, I think it could look a lot offensively like this past Sunday's game did. Well, I mean, like, what what has this Jaguar team done in the last four or five years that gives Doug Marone any confidence that yeah. if they're down two possessions that they could, you know, come back and win the game? And it, it seems almost like Marone – and and it might be his fault, you know, if what he says is true or, you know, it is true. I'm not, I'm not doubting Doug Marone. He seems like a stand up guy. Yeah. That, you know? that, that's one thing I'll give about Doug Marone. He, he tells it how it is, you know? Yeah. And I, and I, and I believe that with Doug Marone, but it seems like he's taken like almost all of the impact of Nick Foles's poor performance and putting it on himself. Some would say that's a good coach, but I think, you know, maybe he's trying to maybe try to overcompensate for the fact that maybe he, you know, either brought Nick Foles back too early or, you know, he doesn't want to say just flat out that his $88 million quarterback had a bad game. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I understand that. I mean, you know, Marone, he's a, you know, just, you know, I've been to dozens of Doug Marone press conferences at this point. And he's a guy that when, you know, the smoke clears and he has to blame somebody, he's going to blame himself. You know, I mean, that, that's just how it is. So, I mean, you can at least give him credit for that. He's not throwing anybody under the bus. But at the same time, yeah, you're the head coach when you guys only run the ball nine times. Uh, franchise career low, by the way. They've never ran the ball less than ten times before Sunday in a game in Jacksonville Jaguars history. Then I think you got to, you know, take the blame for that. And, at, at, you know, at, at, like I said, to his credit, it seems like he does. And I, I think it's just one of those things where – the offense is not built really in the way that it could be to play that style of game with Nick Foles. You know what I mean? Like you, I, you pay a guy $88 million ideally to sling it a ton, but they're built to be a run first team. It's just kind of a juxtaposition. Well, I think that that's kind of the thought process about bringing, you know, guys like flip in trying to tailor this offense to Nick Foles. And I think they, they think they have like that kind of skill set at like wide receiver to be like yeah. this like miniature Eagles offense. And the thing is, is they have good wide receivers. Like DJ Chark obviously is a stud, but I mean, DD Westbrook is just not going to, he's just not going to get it done for you. Chris Conley will show his flashes, but you know, he's had some dropping problems, dropping issues. Keelan Cole, you know, what, what do you want to say about Keelan Cole? He's inconsistent. You know, it's just, it's just not the same team that, you know, it just seems like they're trying to really just change the identity of the offense from one year to the, from one year to the next. And I mean, there's arguments against that because you could say, oh, yeah. well, look at how many yards like Leonard Fournette's had this season. But, yeah. you know, now that Foles is in, if this was the idea for the whole season that they were going to play like this, throw the ball 40 times a game, give Leonard Fournette 15, 16 carries maybe, and it's just like I mean, that would have never worked from the jump. It's a good question, you know, what Leonard Fournette's season would have looked like if Gardner Minshew never came in. But, you know, to play devil's advocate, we do have to see – uh, you know, what this Foles offense looks like in a more uh, expanded sample size. Uh, you know, for, for as bad as the offense was Sunday, it is a one-game sample. Uh, if the Jaguars obviously want to win more games, they're going to have to change it up some. So we'll, we'll see on Sunday against the Titans if they do. But, uh, Tree, uh, Sunday against the Titans, if they lose, does the season die in Nashville? And if, if so, what, what, what can they really accomplish over the next, you know, month and a half? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, it's done. Like if, yep. they, if they if they if they lose, it's over. That's a dagger. Like yeah. And and, and I hate. I, I'm. I won't go on too long of a rant, but I just want to go on a little rant real quick. So people are saying, you know, like lay off Nick Foles. It's a small sample size, and I get that. Like that's a, like a hundred percent true. And I would get that even more if we were either like completely out of the playoff discussion. Or we were literally so like close to like clinching the division. Like I would understand that argument, but if we're in like the thick of things, like we are right now, 
and you know Foles performed that way it's like we should have never played him in the first place the Jaguars should never played him in the first place and that's just that's just how I, I feel about that situation yeah no I mean I I, I think anybody would tell you, and I think Foles would tell you that he needs to play better and that the entire offense needs to play better. And don't, don't get it twisted that obviously that we're thinking it was only a Nick Foles issue. It's not. When, yeah, when it's an not offense enough, struggles, no. it's a lot more. But when you're an $88 million quarterback, I think that you have to elevate some of those things around you. And I don't think you can make some of the decisions that he was making. But obviously he's going to get the rest of the season really to stake his claim. Uh, I, I can't envision a scenario where if he's healthy, he's not playing. So he, he's going to have six more chances to go out there and show what he can do, uh, you know, in this offense. And uh, I I think he's going to play better than he did on Sunday because, you know, like, like we said, that was his first game in, you know, what, two months. I, yeah. I, I think everybody should have expected him to look rusty. Uh, you know, that's probably on uh, on really the expectations that were set for him that people didn't expect him to look rusty. That was probably a bit unfair, I think. Yeah, I, I get that point of view. But it's, it's just – it's hard to necessarily feel bad for the guy when they made this decision right when we're in the thick of things, you know. And I, and I made the point, you know, when this was, you know, becoming a discussion that I didn't like the argument with Minshew saying, let's roll with the hot hand, let's roll with Minshew. But now, like, looking back on it, hindsight's twenty twenty. I mean – maybe that would have been the better issue. And, yeah. you know, you, you see – I mean, you see people say, like, if Nick Foles had a good game, you guys would be, you know, saying their praise or whatever. The media Obviously. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, it's like that's obvious. But, I mean, like, I don't I don't know. I don't yeah. Know. It, it, I just wish it went better. Yeah, no, no, for sure, for sure. And I'm, I'm fascinated to see how the next six games play out because then we're going to have pretty even sample sizes for each to kind of see how the offense was under each quarterback. So I'm really interested to uh, see that and, you know, to see if, you know, Doug Marone made the right decision because, uh, I mean, by all accounts, it was purely a Doug Marone decision. And like I said, uh, you know, two weeks ago, if I was Doug Marone, I probably would have made the same decision because I'm a coach thinking I need to stack together some wins. Uh, This rookie has been impressive, but do I trust him? Or do I trust the veteran passer that we just gave a buttload of money to to help me maybe keep my job? And I, I don't blame him for the decision he made. And it's going to be six more weeks until we see if it was the right decision or not. But I, I, I think he made, you know, some good points. But, I mean, overall, when it comes to Sunday's game, I agree that, you know, obviously they basically need to win it. Uh, if they don't, I think, they are, I think they already need to be doing a lot of self-evaluating and a lot of looking at the mirror uh, from the top down of the team just to see, you know, how they're doing things and uh, really how they've built the team. Uh, if they win, I think you can hold on to a little bit of hope uh, for the season. You know, I mean, you're at five and six. That's not really a great place to be, but obviously it's a better place to be at than four and seven. But I mean, I, I can see it either way. But I, I, when it comes to Sunday, is there a specific player that you think really needs to step up to give them a chance to win? I mean, I, not specifically. Like, I think just this whole run rush defense needs to improve. Like, yeah, you, you need – the play calling needs to improve. The defense. Let's just say the defense. Like, the defense as a whole needs to play a better football – needs to play a better football game this week. And the thing is, is that you're coming off a week where you allowed 200 yards rushing to, you know, Marlon Mack, who has, you know, had a great season. And then some Jonathan Williams guy who I've personally never heard of. Yeah. So you got a guy like Derrick Henry is a three down back. He has a 99 yard rushing touchdown against the Jaguars on primetime football. You know what he can do. What they need to do is they need to stop him immediately and they need to game plan. They need to actually look like, they have been practicing for Derrick Henry and making sure that they know that that's the number one thing they need to shut down. And I would like to see a little bit more man-to-man coverage. I know with Todd Wash that might be asking a little bit too much, but I want to see a little bit more man-to-man coverage. I want to see, you know, some more blitzes. Like if Ryan Tannehill's dropping back to pass, make sure that he can't even get that pass off. So I think it really comes down to this defense because I think the defense, if they play – to their full potential, I think they have every chance in the world to hold the Titans under, like, 20 points. I think they can hold them under 20 points. And if you're able to do that, then I think Nick Foles can 
hold his end of the bargain and do what he needs to do with the offense. Yeah, yeah, no, and definitely. I, I think uh, some run blitzes would be uh, one of the biggest, uh, you know, things that they really need because, I mean, they just have to scheme something up, you know, to stop the Titans running game because you know the Titans plan is going to be to run the ball run the ball run the ball there's no way that they watch the Colts tape and come out throwing it 40 times with Brian Tannehill and if they do I challenge Mike Vrabel to an arm wrestling contest myself to prove to him that I, I, I'm the better football mind because I just cannot envision that they come out and don't feed Derrick Henry and because of that I think Miles Jack is uh, the most important non-quarterback this week because I, I think he needs to elevate his game. I think he I think he would be the first to tell you that he needs to elevate his game. And I just think they need uh, the Miles Jack of, you know, 2017 to come out there on Sunday. And the Miles Jack from the Cincinnati Bengals game this year, the New Orleans Saints game, because he has flashed at times this season. Don't get it wrong and, you know, think I'm saying that he has been bad in every game this season because that's not true. He has had good games this season. But they need him to flip the momentum and get past this past Sunday. And I think he is the most important player uh, this Sunday, not named Nick Foles, because, you know, when you're playing middle linebacker against Derrick Henry, uh, you read one play wrong, get in the one wrong gap, and he's, you know, going down the field for an 80-yard touchdown. Yeah, I agree 100%. I think Miles Jack obviously is a big part of the Jags defense if they're going to be stopping the run. And I – I, I think he's had a good season. I think it's been probably his worst season that he's had so far. And I think, like you said, Miles Jack would probably be the first one to say that. And it's because he's – I mean, look at the look at the talent he was around, like, I mean, in 2018 and mm-hmm. 2017. Like you said, Paul Puslesny, Telvin Smith, he never had to be, like, that guy. All he really needed to be was, like, an athletic guy that made a whole lot of plays. And now that he is the guy that's getting paid this money, he's the guy that's going to be the leader of the defense – you know, it's, it's it's just like a lot is riding on Miles Jack's shoulders that he's not used to. So I think, you know, maybe cut him a little slack because this is the first year he's in a real leadership kind of role uh, would be would be fine. But like you said, he hasn't had terrible games all season long. I think uh, definitely the biggest player to watch out for in this game. Yeah, no, I, absolutely, absolutely. And, I mean, I, I think you made a good point. Uh, you know, this is his second year ever playing Mike linebacker. And for those saying move him to weak side linebacker, and well, I do think that could maybe help him. He's never played weak side linebacker in the NFL. You know, he, that's never once been what he did because he played strong side linebacker his rookie year. Then he played strong side run, linebacker on rundowns in 2017. And then nickel middle linebacker, you know, on third downs. And then he, he's been a middle linebacker since. You know, I mean, he's never once played will linebacker for the Jacksonville Jaguars. And I, I think that's just something people need to remember. But, uh, you know, I, I – I think, you know, we've kind of covered as much as we can about both the Colts game and the upcoming Titans game. Obviously, we're going to talk more about our reactions to the Titans game after the game next week. But we're going to talk about, uh, you know, just take some of our Twitter questions now. And we actually got a a good amount. So I I really appreciate you guys for, you know, being so, you know, supportive and active with Jaguar Maven. So we'll go ahead and get into uh, some of the questions now. Uh, from my man E. Dilla, he said, "What's the earliest you can see Minshew playing again, assuming Foles stays healthy?" That is that is a good question. <laughs> I, I, I'm a I'm gonna say 2020 because I do not think it happens this year. I think they went so in on Nick Foles this off season that they cannot take him off of the field if he's healthy for Gardner Minshew because once they do the Nick Foles Jaguars experiment is for all intents and purposes over. And I do not think they end that experiment one year into a massive contract. Oh goodness gracious. All right. Second half of the Titans game. I I could, I could see it over what let's get some, that was going to be my fiery hot take at the end of the show, but, but Dilla, Dilla brings it in. I think if Foles, has one of those performances where he either turns the ball over too much or he is just looking terrible. Why would you not play Gardner Minshew? You know what I mean? I get the money thing. I get that you're locked into it. And it seems like as coaches, they are really worrying more about that than about winning football games. And that sucks because it, it, you've seen it like all week this week. 
all like Shad Khan like will get like his hundredth loss like either next season or this season or something if the team like remains on track to how they've been and you know it's like they're investing this money in either like the stadium and all these players but none of them have really been hit so you get this sixth round draft pick that has done things for you and has brought that excitement that no other quarterback did you know you may want to make an argument about like the 2017 Blake Bortles but you know that was Blake Bortles we fell in love with Blake Bortles personality sure we're falling in love with Gardner Minshew's personality but you're also falling in love with his play on the field. And I think he's done enough and he's put up the right amount of numbers to where if Foles is flopping either in the Titans game or any of these next following games, especially if they fall to the Titans this week and they're out of playoff contention, the future's now, man. And then you know that – you know that this next offseason there's going to be a legitimate quarterback battle. Yeah, and I, I think Mitch might have a chance. Yeah, I, I think if – Foles was not in the first year of his contract that there would have been a lot more of a debate who would start when he got healthy but the fact was they needed to find out what he had uh if a healthy Foles does not finish the Titans game I will wire you enough enough money to go live on a Cayman Island (laughs) I I, I just don't see Doug Marone pulling a healthy Nick Foles at any point this season uh, that's been my read of it. I think he's going to, you know, go down swinging with him over these next six games because, like I said, they have that investment in them. They need to find out what they have. They also need to find out what they have in Gardner Minshew, but which one is really more of a priority in their eyes. Uh, it probably, you know, shouldn't be all based around the mighty dollar, but when it comes to the NFL. But it is. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Okay, so that, that was a good question, uh, E. Dilla, the Dilla Cole. We appreciate it. Uh, another question uh, from – from let me see if I can pronounce this. Mel Hyphen. All right, excuse me if I completely destroyed what you were trying to go for with that Twitter app. He said, is Jalen Ramsey better at playing corner than Yannick Ngakwe is at playing defensive end? Uh, it, it's hard, I think, to talk about that because the way they play, they have two different impacts on the game. Jalen's not a dude who's going to be a ball hawk because he shuts down a half of the field and teams aren't going to target him. And that's how he affects the game. He takes out an entire part of the field. He takes out an entire player and makes an offense funnel it to other players. Uh, On the flip side, Yannick Ngakwe affects the game by making those game-changing plays such as, you know, strip fumbles and big-time sacks. So, I don't know. I I think both are amongst the best of their positions. I'd probably give the edge to Jalen just because I think he's dominant snap in and, you know, snap out. Uh, but that's just my read of it. But that's not a slight to Unique because I do think Unique is one of the better pass rushers in the NFL. Um, I think Jalen Ramsey, like you said, does what he does perfectly. And, you know, he's still one of the top corners in the league, if not the top corner in the league. But uh, for what you said for Yannick Ngakwe is why – I'd give Yan a slight edge over Jalen Ramsey because sure he does his job, but the quarterback still has an option to flip it out to, you know, whatever other side that he's not on. But you got Yannick Ngakwe who he can get pick sixes. He can get strip sacks. He can get sacks. He can get hits in the backfield. I just think like with his game and how, you know, good he is at playing that defensive end position. And, you know, with all of the attributes to his game, I think he has more attributes and more, you know, special talent, than Jalen yeah. Ramsey does at a corner position. Yeah, no, and that that's perfectly understandable. I'm not really going to argue that at all because I get both arguments. Okay, so uh, next question from Pint of Jack. Uh, Jack's a great Twitter follow. Definitely recommend, uh, uh, you know, following him. He has great Jags takes. Uh, he said, has Trey Herndon shown enough where you can conceivably roll into 2020 with Fourier and him on the boundary and feel good? Uh, I think this is a little bit of a hot take amongst Jags, uh, you know, people that follow the team. I think Herndon's been fine at corner, and I would roll into 2020 with him starting. Uh, have a backup plan, obviously. That's not free on borders. But I would start him next season, and I would feel good about it. I think I'm 100% on the same page. Like, I mean, either in free agency you get, like, a guy that – won't cost you too much money to invest in, but you know, you know that he has some sort of talent. Give Trey Herndon some competition out there. But like you said, I think Herndon has been just fine. I think the secondary for the Jaguars 
doesn't get enough love, you know, yeah, post Jalen Ramsey. I really don't think it's been bad at all, man. People kill it some because of the completions they give up in zone. But I really do think the secondary has been solid. And uh, my man Mike K tweeted out yesterday, uh, best pa- defender passer ratings by NFL DB since week seven. Trey Herndon has the best pa- defender passer rating. When people throw at him, they have a passer rating of 40.4 since week seven. That's better than Marcus Peters, and Marcus Peters has two pick sixes in that time. So it's not just based off interceptions. Herndon's done a good job in coverage. So, you know, I, I, I think he's definitely a guy that people have slept on a little bit. Um, obviously, he's not Jalen Ramsey, but they're never going to ask him to be Jalen Ramsey. They're always going to ask A.J. Boye to be that number one corner. And I think in a number two corner, you can do a lot worse than uh, Trey Herndon. I think uh... – it's something that could be argued if you're not a Trey Herndon guy about that list. I mean, look at how often Herndon got like targeted. Yeah. You yep. know, when, when Jalen got in there and, you know, and sure he gave up a couple of completions, but I mean, look at those numbers, pure numbers, Trey Herndon's like, Oh, you're going to throw at me. Well, let me watch, watch me make this play. So, you know, and yeah. seeing him get that two picks, I think it was the Cincy game or the Jets game. Yeah. It was a Jets game. Yeah. Like, that was awesome. You love to see guys like Herndon succeed. So, yeah. I, I'd, I'd say I'd feel fine with it. Uh, like, like you said, let's have, a, let's have a backup plan. It's not borders, for sure. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Okay, next question from D. Vandenboard. What is the cap hit if Nick Foles gets traded in the offseason? Nick Foles' cap hit if he gets traded in the offseason is $22 million with uh, $125,000, 100000 uh, also thrown in there. So, <laughs> It's not a small number. It's smaller than his dead cap if they release him, which is almost $34 million. But uh, uh, it, if they trade him, they're still paying him, like, plus $20 million. So, I, uh, I, I don't really see that uh, in the car. <laughs> it's unless, unless, yeah. unless it's, like, they do, like, a Brock Eisweiler type trade. Where, like, That's what Browns, I was thinking. Yeah, dude. where, like, the Browns, like, agreed to pay some of his salary if they got a high pick in return. But – if you're trading Nick Foles and a high pick just so a team can pay him, I cannot even begin to explain the reactions that, that, to that one. So, uh, yeah, so his cap hit, if they trade him, $22 million. If they release him, almost $34 million. So it's safe to say Nick Foles is going to be a Jaguar in 2020. Uh, the cap hit, if they trade him in 2021, is even higher than that. It's uh, almost 27000 so uh, the only way I can really see Nick Foles not being a Jaguar in the future is if they cut him in 2021 or 2022. If they cut him in 2021, that's a 12 and a half million dead cap. That's not ideal, obviously, but it's less than the dead cap when they cut Blake Bortles. So, I mean, basically take it or leave it. He's not going anywhere in 2020, I don't think. Ah, that is hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, uh, next question, uh, Rody Report. Head coach, defense coordinator, offense coordinator recommendations for this offseason. I haven't dived too far into, you know, coaching search. I will say the coach I think every team in college football and NFL should target if they have a coaching vacancy is Matt Rule at Baylor because he has just been phenomenal at every stop he's been. Um, I'm going to – and it, don't, don't eat me alive about this because I'm only half serious when I say it. Mike McCarthy, because Mike McCarthy yeah. looks like my dad. <laughs> Literally, like, exactly like my now, dad. And, uh, honestly, I think Mike McCarthy would be a pretty possible hiring. I, I could definitely see it as, like, one of the more, you know, highly likely scenarios. I, I, I wouldn't shoot that He has a ring, all. man. Like, I mean, yeah, he, he, he does. He, 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 has an offen- he has an offensive background. Yeah. I. Uh, oh, man. I, I, I think Mike McCarthy is going to be the next head coach now. How you put that? <laughs> right. Yeah. My dad. Yeah, <laughs> my dad, Trebe's dad, Mike McCarthy. Oh man! All right, so let me see. Okay, uh, so Chris Herman asked uh, if Doug Marone is fired and they go with Minshew at quarterback next year. How about Mike Leach as the new coach of the Jags? Well, as big of a Mike Leach fan as I am, I think he's just kind of a college dude. I th- I think he loves the game of college football. Well, I, I've I've covered the Cougs for like three years now. Mike Leach is not an NFL guy. Yeah. I mean, you may, I love him as a person because he's, he's great in press conferences. He's always late, but he's just such a good, <laughs> he's such a good interview. Like you will always get great sound clips from him. And I think he's going to be chasing after a higher, uh, I was going to say a higher college coaching job next year. I think, I think, should hire him. I think, I think he's going to be kind of looking for that type of, that yeah. type of job because I mean, WSU like this year, they're, 
they're underperforming. But, I mean, you look at guys that he's just made famous. I mean, Gardner was a great quarterback. But, I mean, like, Anthony Gordon is not that great on paper, but he's, you know, Mike Leach is still making it a way where he leads the nation in passing yards. So, he's definitely a good coach, but I don't think he's NFL coach. Kyle. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm with you. I don't really see that. Um, All right. This one is from uh, Actually Toast. It is, uh, if you had to choose that number three wideout spot next year, are you taking Keelan Cole or Marquise Lee? Uh, if we're talking about just on the field, I'm taking Keelan Cole. When you factor in Marquise Lee's uh, contract, I think he – you have to go, you know, Keelan Cole, because I, I just don't see a way Marquis Lee's on this team next season. No, and I put my foot in my mouth so hard this year because I was like, Marquis Lee's going to bounce back. He's going to have a great year. And unfortunately, just he hasn't lived up to that title. Yeah, so yeah I, Keelan Cole. I, I, I feel bad for him because he, he really is one of the most well-respected guys in that locker room. And injuries, it's not his fault. Yeah, injuries are never the guy's fault, you know. I mean, it, it just he, he's had terrible injury luck since he signed that deal. And I feel for him because – I, I can't imagine, you know, what's, what goes on with, like, a player's, like, you know, mentality when, you know, they, they want to play. So, when you have two seasons cut short due to injury, I, I, I can't imagine, you know, what that does to a person. And, but by all accounts, uh, I think DJ Chark told me, uh, Marquise Lee is the most positive person I've ever met in my life. So, I'm, I'm sure that's helping him in his recovery and obviously the best wishes to him as he uh, bounces back from his shoulder injury. Okay, uh, n- next question. Um let me see. Why did Quincy Williams get zero snaps on defense? That's from Jaguars87. Uh, uh, Quincy got benched a few weeks ago, even though they're not really calling it a benching. Uh, basically, Quincy Williams, this is his first year ever playing linebacker, and it just happens to be that occurs in the NFL. He played a hybrid safety role in college. He had never made like regular linebacker reads. He is learning literally all of this for the first time. And then you add in his meniscus injury that sidelined him for four to five weeks during training camp. And he got put behind the learning curve a little bit. So I, I, I really do think they're just trying to mold him and build him from the ground up in terms of playing the linebacker position. And I think that's why he's not playing on defense. Hit the nail on the head. Don't really yeah. got much to say after that one. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, last one. Uh, Scotty D for life. Would it be in the best interest for the Jaguars to have a front office in place next year that is not drafting to save their jobs, regardless of how the season winds up? I mean, I think anytime you <laughs> yeah. have a front office that's you know making moves for job security, I think that's uh, you know going to be an issue. So I, I, I just think having lame duck anything, whether it's a front office, coaching staff, a lame duck quarterback, I just don't think that's a good position to be in. Uh, I think we need to put uh, Eric Dunn, John, John, and uh, Dilla in the front office, as, as uh, Dunn tweeted out. I think that's I, I, the, uh, the next GM move. I would never do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not about that front office life i've i've uh i, I i've seen uh the hours they spend and uh you know the the things that they have to do i am perfectly good here in my armchair uh gm role same same <laughs> uh what would if you had to pick any role like whether it be a player a coach gm owner like in professional football what would you choose no i mean like owner o- owner you get to do whatever you want i mean J- jerry true. jerry jones he, he wiles out man i mean he, he gives yeah he gives press conferences after games that is bonkers to me dude he is like literally has media availability after games so i i, I have to go owner because i i think being a head coach in the nfl uh, you only enjoy it if you really love football because i do not see a single positive to doing it because <laughs> i mean it takes up your life and then you only have so much chance of your team actually being good. And I, I, I think that's just a big stress. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, that's, that's how I'm feeling. You know, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm good in my role uh, watching the game and analyzing it and writing about it. I'm telling you right now, put me as an OC. And uh, anybody that wants to get this Madden work, you can add me on PSN at Trey is Raw, and I will destroy you in every bit of the way. So, <laughs> cheap plug for my PSN if anybody want to get this work. <laughs> oh man, uh, Tree, but you know, we we've kind of we we had a lot of questions this week, and we went over a lot. I don't really have any uh, parting hot takes because we kind of went through all of them. And my hot take was going to be that Trey Herndon is a good number two cornerback, and that they should roll with him next season, and that drafting a cornerback in the first round should not be on the table. Uh, that's my hot take. I don't think they should go cornerback in the first round, either of those picks. I think go for it later on, but I think wide receiver, 
offensive line, linebacker, defensive tackle. I think all of those are bigger needs than cornerback. But that's just me personally. I mean, you have any uh, final hot takes? Uh, my hot take was going to be that uh, Gardner Minshew came in during the second half of the Titans game, but that one kind of got destroyed. There's a there's a hot take I got, non jag related. Always like to throw one out before the uh, before the podcast ends. And me and John had a discussion about it, and he says I'm dead wrong. But I'm gonna take Outback Steakhouse over Texas Roadhouse every day of the week. Yeah, that's that's our cue to go ahead and uh, wrap things <laughs> up. <laughs> Man, te- Texas Roadhouse can't be beat. It it, it cannot be beat. I I, I don't care what anybody says. I will go to bat for Texas Roadhouse every time. And, uh, I mean, I, I truly – I'll defend Texas Roadhouse. Like, I defend uh, the honor of anybody in my family because, I, <laughs> I, 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 yeah, I hold, I hold it dear. So, but, uh, I mean, t- thank you all again, uh, you know, for listening to Jaguar Maven Podcast. We appreciate you all immensely. Uh, you know, keep interacting with Jaguar Maven on Twitter. Keep reading the articles. Like I said, we put out several a day for you guys. It's not just you're going to log on there on a, you know, Tuesday afternoon and see the same thing that you saw Monday morning. We're giving you all new stuff. And, uh, you know, just thanks for being, all, you know, along, you know, on this journey with us. I, I really do appreciate it. Tree, you got anything? Uh, it's fun doing these podcasts every week. It's fun being a member of Jaguar Maven. You can follow me on Twitter at Troop Talks and you can follow me or subscribe to me on YouTube at Troop Talks as well. We're going to have a crew cast up there. Um, should be on Thursday or Friday. And on Wednesday, uh, if you want to w- listen to this Jaguar Maven podcast again, you can listen to it on YouTube as well. It'll be on there too. So double your Jaguar Maven intake. Oh, yeah. Uh, and like, like we said, everybody, we appreciate it. Uh, Trib, thanks for coming on again, buddy. I appreciate it. Had a good time talking Jaguars with you. Uh, you know, and we'll see next week if we're talking about a victory or a loss because since we started the Jaguar Maven podcast, the Jaguars have not won a game, and I will Ugh. take full responsibility for that. It's our fault. <laughs> yeah, 100%. <laughs> All right, thanks again, everybody. Peace out.